afternoon. I, I was warned where I was sitting that uh, there was an impossible act to follow, not a hard act to follow. So uh, it's going to be downhill all the way from here. <laughs> but that's okay. Sometimes that has to happen. Uh, one of the many, many facts of life. But I, I think also that an interesting uh, uh, part of how it will happen is that I, I had a, a PowerPoint uh, a presentation. And as I was leaving Lagos in the mix-up of things, I managed to leave it. And I thought, that's even better. <laughs> because now we can have a conversation. Because, to be frank, I am tired of the PowerPoint presentations. Because we keep getting them and going nowhere. Uh, very often I say to myself, um, if I just think of the number of presentations I, just I alone, have made, I'm sure we can fill this room <laughs> with, with the presentations. And um, I come back very often several years afterwards, nothing has changed. In, indeed, a friend of mine uh, published a, a book many, many years ago, the late Penny Jason, a collection of his uh, columns, newspaper columns. It was titled, A Familiar Road. Uh, and when I go back and read some things that I wrote 30 years ago, if I publish them today, somebody will say, brilliant mind. I mean, he has captured this moment, but they were written 30 years ago. Now, that is not a pleasant place to be. And so I thought that uh, to uh, make conversation, I, I would like to begin with this simple question of ideas being put down and execution not going anywhere. Um, many, many years ago, I was privileged to work with a couple of gentlemen, they were professors from Oxford, uh, uh, who DFID had asked to work uh, with a couple of us on um, Drivers of Change, I think it was, for Nigeria. And, and one evening in Abuja, we were uh, really looking at all these graphs, and, and one of them at a point said, oh my goodness, this is a classic recursive economy. Two steps forward, four steps backwards. And you just look at the graphs the way that they're going. And, and, and I said to, um, to the gentleman, I said, why do you think that is the case? He says, I, I can't put my finger on it. But it's obvious, you can see, it. look at all the graphs. And I said, well, it's very simple. We get into a lot of conversation about policy. And sometimes that yields great policy. As we begin to try to implement the policy, there's some progress and then it hits a very weak institution, and there's a pushback. And so the Nigerian economy is been essentially uh, a recursive economy. And, and so really, to make progress, we have to begin with changing mindsets and truly committing to building stronger institutions. I, I like to remind people very often that uh, it is not by accident our well, it was a great gift in that perhaps the very first speech that Mr. Obama made in Africa as President of the United States of America in Accra caught a point I was making the day before in Lagos, almost exactly the same words. In fact, somebody called me and said, are you sure you don't supply information to the White House? I said, what do you mean? Because it's almost exactly the words you used at Golden Gate yesterday were used by President Obama in Accra. And he says, Africa does not need strong men. What Africa needs are strong institutions. And we somehow like to look for strong men. And you know what happens with strong men? And, uh, and this is leading up to a very important part of the base of this conversation. We like to look for strong men uh, because we, we have this messiah complex. You know, um, it will deliver us from all our troubles. And then the strong man comes. Now, if he's going to deliver you from all your troubles, he has to purge you from the troubles of the other strong man that came. 
And so the season of purging you of the troubles of the old guy essentially brings you back to zero. And then, because he's a strong man, the day he goes, every strong thing he has done will go with him. A um, couple of years ago, the governors of this region, the South-South, had a, a big meeting. They decided that they were tired of trying, that they needed more private sector thinking types to do a roadmap, offer direction for the region. And they brought together chiefly private sector types, some academic types, a couple of strong former government types, including one former finance minister. I was in the mix. And the meeting was in Port Harcourt. And the chairman of the governors of the South-South, uh, Lieli Moke, uh, then looked behind and said to me, would you be so kind as to chair this uh, initiative? And I thought, okay, why not? And for months, we worked so hard at developing a roadmap for the region. Uh, you know, some people thought it was impossible, that it would not happen. Indeed, the then vice president of the country, who represented the president at the time, Umaru Musa Yaradua, was the former governor from the region. And so when he arrived to Napa, where that conference uh, uh, took place, he said, we didn't think this was possible because we tried. It, did not, it could not happen. I think the wisdom is that these governors asked you private sector types to run it. Um, out of that effort came what I, th I thought was pretty decent roadmap. But where is that roadmap today? In fact, we, we recommended an implementing agency um, that would be institutionalized, just like the way the U European Commission exists, and would take that going forward. Just because one or two governors, strong men, felt very strongly, all that effort has literally come to naught. We have not gone further than when we gathered for six, seven years ago in Port Harcourt and then on to Tinapa. And so we must do something about restraining strong men. The first thing we need is to buy some leashes so that we can restrain strong men. Because strong men have been a major part of the problem. The other thing I think this region needs and I'm going to get to the heart of how I think investments and growth can come to this region, but it will be significantly going back to some of what we did back then, uh, is that we need uh, better coordination. Now, everybody's carving out a piece of this action, and most times they're working at cross purposes. NDDC, South-South Economic, uh, 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 this agency, that agency, there isn't the coordination that should take place. And then there is a big, big, big problem. Government. Why is government a problem? Government is a problem because of a number of reasons. One of the reasons that government is a problem it's something many of us learned as young graduate students, what is called the tragedy of the commons. That which belongs to all belongs to none. You know the typical grazing field in England, the commons. And we all take our cattle there and it grazes and, and you know and you know everybody all the cattle feed fat until the field becomes Sahara Desert and the cattle begin to die. But if somebody owned that field, he would know that it was in his economic interest for the cattle to find some grass next week. And so he will regrass the field. 
uh, government, the Leviathan, essentially was supposed to ensure that we lived a better life, pulling the comet collective good to save us from this brutish life that the philosophers of government talked about. Unfortunately, the way it has worked, you now have books, and I, I love this, Getting Government Out of the Way. This, is a this book is sitting on my shelf. You want to make progress? Find a way of getting government out of the way. It should not be, but it is. How do we deal with this problem? Well, a couple of years ago, the question about how development should take place resulted in a conference in Nairobi that was uh, sponsored by the Aga Khan Foundation. This was about 1985. And that conference looked at a tripartite approach to development that would engage government, the private sector, and what typically was called private development agencies, PDAs, the NGO uh, 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 sector, not-for-profit uh, uh, sector. And out of that conference came a movement that was known as the Enabling Environment Forum. Um, at the time, the um, private sector from Nigeria was represented by chief executive of gentleman, I mean, chief executive of a company that was one of the biggest listed companies in Nigeria, a gentleman called Enes Shunekon. Uh, the public sector was represented by a federal permanent secretary called Alaji Abubakar Alaji. And the PDAs, the private development agencies, are represented by Dr. Jack. And from the Nairobi conference, we founded what was called the Enabling Environment Forum. How do we create an enabling environment for development? Uh, one of those gentlemen, Chief Enes Shunekon, in one of those arrangements that is very Nigerian, became head of government. And during the course of that service, what is now known as the Nigerian Economic Summit was inaugurated. And it was designed for the private sector, the public sector, and private development agencies to sit together and look for cooperative ways to make development that is significantly private sector led with strong government institutions supporting and private development agencies playing a critical role in stimulating development. Um, unfortunately, the big elephant in the room sucked up all the air, and government. Um, government kept getting so big. I mean, uh, in basic economics, if we look at how growth really takes place, you will see that we look at consumption from corporates as one sector, household consumption, government, and then the external sector. The way Nigeria has evolved is that many times government gets bigger and bigger and bigger, household income is shrinking and shrinking and shrinking, and at a point in time where we were more or less a pariah and it's beginning to come, in some ways around now, external sector is shrinking and shrinking. And so all we have is government whose consumption is very inefficient at best. And so the kind of growth, the kind of development that we expect uh, does not take place. How do we break this? How do we gain traction? I am getting more from my experience because I've been through this so frequently over the last 30 years, I'm getting to a point where I am going for radical approaches to solving the problems of development. Uh, because I don't think these PowerPoint presentations come to anything. I've made many of them. I've seen many of them made. 
and have seen us back where we started so frequently that we really have to take ownership of the mind of people because that is where the challenge lies. Um, we talk about what we should do in the Niger Delta. But we all know that there is an entitlement mentality that has taken hold. And so people are looking for what you will give them and not what they can do to improve their lives. And it leads me uh, back to a uh, very important conversation that went on about 40 something years ago. There was an, a Brazilian educator called Paulo Freire. Paulo Freire wrote what was one of the best selling books in education, some very radical departures in thinking. The book was titled The Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And Paulo Freire argued that colonized peoples made progress very slowly because the nature of their education, the pedagogy that was applied to them, treated their minds essentially like piggy banks in which you basically deposited enough coins to make them understand their reality but not to transform their reality. And because Paulo Freire was Marxist, he argued for an ideological reframing of the mind that would lead to people having a vision of tomorrow that was radically different from where they were coming from and then seeking the kind of knowledge that would come in and lead them to creating that tomorrow. Whether I was fortunate or unfortunate, I was never a Marxist. A very Catholic upbringing left me with a view uh, in which I was probably the only person in my class who didn't claim to be a comrade. You know, in those days, when we were in the university, you had to be a Marxist to be considered intelligent. If you were not Marxist, you were not really smart. And so, um, I learned very quickly from somebody, the big saying, that if at 18 you are not a Marxist, something is wrong with your heart. But if at 40 you are still a Marxist, Something is wrong with your head. <laughs> <laughs> so, my Catholic upbringing did not allow something to be wrong with my head. But it may have seemed that it wasn't quite right with my heart early. But there was logic to Paulo Freire's writing. The problem with it was his Marxist, uh, uh, what I, I draw from Reinhard Bendix, not sorry, not Bendix, uh, 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 Jürgen Habermas, Utopia. So, um, I began to argue even from back in grad school in the in the seventies and eighties that I thought that we should rethink Paulo Freire along lines that I call the pedagogy of the determined. That determined people who want to break out of the state in which they were caught in which you were not making progress, had to take an entrepreneurial orientation to the world in which they lived. An entrepreneurial orientation in which they must vision tomorrow and have a certain vision of the world that they needed to create, drawing from what was happening in the world around them. With that, if you will, ideological state, seek the kind of knowledge that will get them where they should be going. In this regard, I was speaking at a job creation summit called by the River State Government a couple of years ago. And I said, interestingly, uh, the um, former president of Ghana, Jerry Rawlings, was chair of that event. He was giving the keynote. And I said, you know, um, we keep talking of job creation, job creation, and nobody has enough knowledge to create any job. I said, let me take, give you an example. When I enter a room, one of the first things I look that is the floor. I look at the tiling. If the lines are straight, I say to myself, some Togolese have worked here. <laughs> some Togolese and some Ghanaians have worked here. If the lines are like River Niger, I know that my people have worked here. <laughs> and Jerry Rollins said, oh, you are too kind to us Ghanaians. Even we too say, we know some Togolese have worked here. <laughs> the 
the skills to work are not here. So we go to the Niger Delta, we tell them all kinds of things, but they have no skills. And they can create nothing because they have no skills. And their mindsets are off. The pedagogy of the determined has to begin by reprogramming the minds of these people from the entitlement mentality first and foremost, and then giving them skills that they can then use to recreate their condition. And I suggested that that's Job Creation Summit, that we should perhaps turn to something I called executive vocational education. You know, it has to sound that big and nice for it to be appealing to the Nigerian. Uh, why? You know, we have all these people with master's degrees in history, sociology, and uh, all kinds of things waiting for an uncle to be appointed local government chairman so they can be PA because they have no skills to do anything really. But if you gather these people together and you say, look, if you say to them, look, we'll put you through training in plumbing, they will feel seriously insulted. So you don't want to insult them. So you gather them together and you say, we have this executive vocational education program. What it takes to get in is a master's degree. And we'll teach you some tiling And then we'll teach you some entrepreneurship. And then you become an entrepreneur of tiling. So that you can put together small gangs of tilers. And then you can make so much money, you can drive your BMW to go and say hello to your friend who's still looking for a job. When I came back to my seat, as a professor, and I will mention... The professor from University of Port Harcourt, professor of economics, who was sitting close by me, he said, you know what? Uh, one governor, you know names mentioned, one governor standing by said, ah, this part who told me he likes to speak grammar. The only business that is making profit in Nigeria is politics. Now, really, seriously, uh, truly, until we can begin to reprogram minds, literally speaking, until we can begin to provide real skills to people, we're all dressed up with nowhere to go. And so, what needs to be done? This is the approach that I and hopefully my influence on the committee on the South-South uh, took. We took the approach that we needed to create zones of development within the region based on the factor endowments to become globally competitive on the value chains of those endowments. Why was this important? Well, first of all, one of the biggest problems we have had in Nigeria is that Im imitation, imitation sometimes is not a great form of flattery. It's a great way to fall. Um, back again when I was in grad school, there was a lot of excitement um, about some thesis in international political economy called dependency theory, the dependistas, as they were known. And I used to say in class that dependency theory was very elegant theorizing with no redemptive value. And one gentleman I loved very much, who was the father, literally, of dependency theory, was a Brazilian taking cover at the Economic Commission for Latin America. His name, Enrique Fernando Cardoso. And Cardoso and the school of dependency theory basically argued at the time that under development in Latin America, Africa, and places was a function 
of a dependency relationship with the industrialized north or west, as you may choose. And some of the offerings of how we can break away from that was to go into selective delinking from international capitalism. Well, Kadoso is one of my great heroes because from that age of, pardon my usage, of unreason, as I like to call it, I was a very naughty, precocious graduate student. Uh, from that age of unreason, um, Cardoso returned from exile to Brazil after the military left and all of that, ended up as foreign minister of Brazil. And he was at the UN one day getting ready to make one of those speeches that are made there. And he gets a call from the president of Brazil. Now, at that time, the lifespan of finance ministers in Brazil was a couple of weeks. <laughs> because things were going so bad. Inflation was running so high. Everything was out. So you, after a couple of weeks, you were thought of as the problem, and you were shipped out, and the next person came in. And the president says to, uh, in the call, Professor Cardoso, how would you like to be finance minister? And the security of the job of foreign minister was looking him in the face. And he said, Mr. President, I'm just about to make a speech. When I finish making this speech, uh, in the morning, I will call you. And we, we, we can discuss the matter. So he finished his speech, got back to his hotel room, and there's a call from his wife. And trust me, my wife does this to me all the time, so I can imagine how was. His wife says to him, what have I done to you that you have to do this to me? <laughs> and the poor, poor guy says, what have I done again? <laughs> Sounds like the kind of conversation I have all the time with my wife. He says, how can you accept the finance minister? Me? Accept the finance minister? He's been announced. You are the new finance minister. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, can also give some thought to it. He says, well, I don't have much of a choice. I'm a patriot. I've worked so hard for how Brazil will make progress. So he gets on the plane. He returns uh, to Brazil. He's now finance minister. Mark you, there's something we know Cardoso for. All his intellectual life. Father of dependency theory. The ultimate dependista. And what is at stake is not Cardoso for him. It's Brazil. And Cardoso decides to pull together a group of very bright, young Brazilian economists. And he says to them, look, you guys can quarrel and fight from morning till night, moving towards a consensus on what we should do. When you begin to approach consensus, invite me in so I can get in on your logic. And what I want to promise you is that whatever the consensus ultimately is, I will use my credibility with the people of Brazil to go forward and say this is the way we are going. And you can bet that the consensus stood on its head everything that Cardoso ever advocated as an academic. And Cardoso went forward with it. Within a short time, inflation came to a screeching halt. Brazil's economy began to grow again. And that, track, that direction of policy was globalization, not selective delinking from international capitalism. Now today, you and I know where the Brazilian economy is. And that comes from thinking leaders applying themselves. One of the problems of Nigeria is that we've not had thinking leaders apply themselves. Um, and so when you look at the Niger Delta and what needs to be done, competitiveness has to be at the heart of what we need to move forward. But the truth of the matter is that we can create millions of jobs in the Niger Delta. Just change policies, get government out of the way, allow anybody who would like to invest in refineries for export and dot the Nigerian coastline with refineries. But when government will persist in this uneducated discussion of fuel subsidy, you will never get policies right. I'm sorry I get very excited about these things and I need to stop. 
But one of the ways that we can move forward is use the concept and the ideas of social impact bonds to attract capital, to get PDAs to provide many, a lot of the development that government is not geared to providing. I thank you for your attention.